In this video, we're going to talk about how header files work in C++, and a short summary of that is pretty much it's the same as they work in C. Suppose we wanted to find a class called example. So we would put the class declarations, any symbolic constants that are related to that class, and if we have a simple class method that we wanted to find, all of that stuff we would put into the header file. Now typically I'll put the constructors and the destructors in the header file, although that's not required. But anything that's not a simple one-liner type method, I'll leave and, and implement that in the C++ file. And again, all of this stuff is by convention. You don't have to do it. There's a lot of flexibilities. You could put everything in the header file and include it. But again, that takes away some of the abstraction you have by putting just the external facing things in the header file and then having a C++ file that's separate that allows you to change that out to update the implementation part of your class. So the C++ file that goes with that header file will have the class method definitions. And also if there's any utility methods that don't make sense to use outside of the example class. So that could be things that do quick updates or small calculations that make writing the code for your class definition easier, but those things don't have a lot of use outside the class itself. And so those would go there. Again, anything that's not declared in the header file won't be easily visible in outside code, even if that code includes the header file. So example CPP would include example HPP. So then we have a derived class from our example class. And so it's going to have a header file that has, again, its class declarations and so forth. That header file will need to include example.hpp, although we don't actually have to explicitly do it in the C++ file for our derived class because that class will include derived.hpp, which in turn includes the example header file. So suppose we have an, a program that uses our example class. That program would include example.hpp, and then we would compile with example.cpp in order to get all of those method definitions. Again, we include the header file, compile with the code file. If we have another program that uses the example class, again, we include example.hpp and that program. And then when we compile this program, we compile with program 2.0.c++ and example.cpp. So in this example, we'll create a shape class hierarchy that has a base class called shape that is abstract. It'll have three derived classes, rectangle, triangle, and circle. And rectangle will have a derived class called square. And we'll create each of these where we have our declarations in our header file for each of these shapes. And then we'll have the implementation of their methods in a C++ file. Now, one thing you'll notice, if we have five classes, that means we're going to have 10 total files because we'll have a header file and a C++ file for each class. So here's our shape class. And hopefully by this point, all of this should be mostly review. You should have seen some examples of a lot of what we're doing here. I have added some comments just in case you're still trying to learn some of these concepts. So we have a protected member called type. We'll use that type to store what the class is actually called. So the shape constructor takes a string reference. That way we're not changing whatever's passed here. And it has a default parameter of shape. We use an initializer here to set the type. We have a non-virtual method called print that just prints I am a shape. Again, remember, if it's not virtual, that means that the type of the pointer is going to determine what method gets called. We have a virtual method called print type, which will print out what type of shape we're actually working with. And then we have two pure virtual or abstract methods for area and perimeter. And what this means is that any class that derives from shape will have to implement area and perimeter or else it will be abstract as well. So our rectangle header file. First off, remember, we're going to have the guards so that we don't include this more than once. And that becomes a real danger here because we could have cases, for example, where our square class is going to include rectangle, but also our main file is going to include rectangle. And so there's the potential that rectangle would be included twice if we didn't have this. So what this looks like is we have this shape header file. That header file is included by rectangle, circle, and triangle. No problems so far. And again, the way including works is you get a copy of the shape class inside of the header file at compile time. The include statement basically says, copy the material from here into this file before you compile. Now, square also inherits from rectangle, 
So even though it doesn't directly include the shape header file, it still gets the shape class indirectly by including. So suppose I'm writing a program that is going to include a bunch of shapes. Well, if I include all of these header files, I'm going to have a bunch of copies of the shape class if I don't have those guards there. But with the guards, the first time I include shape, I get a shape class. But every subsequent time, it says, wait, I've seen this include file before. And so it doesn't include the text that's inside the guards. So if we had this situation, we would have a multiply defined class. Even though it's only defined in one file, I'm including this file here, here, and here in these header files. And then all four of these header files and the square as well are being included in my main program. So I'm going to get a copy for each of those header files. That's why I need the guards. Again, the guard checks to see if we've seen this header file before. And if not, it defines rectangle underscore HPP. And so next time it sees this, rectangle HPP will be defined and all of this will be ignored. You'll also notice that our header file has the extension HPP. That's just so that we know that this is a C++ header file. Any extension will work. You'll, it's very common to see .h C++ headers. In my opinion, though, that becomes a little bit confusing because when I see .h, I think that's a C header file, and maybe I'll try to include it in the C program. So I think it's better just to be explicit and just say HPP. So the rectangle class is going to derive from shape, and it's going to have two new members, length and width. So the constructor for rectangle is going to take a length, a width, and then it'll have a constant string reference for the type We'll have a default parameter of rectangle. Length and width, though, don't have default parameters. We'll use the parent class constructor to set our type, and we'll use initializers for length and width. And then I have four function declarations for area, perimeter, print, and print type. So we're overriding every method in the shape class. And you'll notice I use the override keyword here. That tells the compiler that I'm anticipating overriding this method. So if I did something like, for example, added a parameter here, this would actually create an error, and you can see here that my compiler is telling me that member function declared with override does not override a base class. So I need to make sure that my function signature matches what was in the base class. And again, this doesn't change how this works. It just is a signal to the compiler of what my intentions are so that it can make sure that my intentions are carried out. While it may seem overkill, it's really nice to have the compiler check to make sure you don't accidentally add a parameter where you shouldn't to all of a sudden create it where you haven't actually overridden a method that you intended to. Notice that print, even though we are declaring a method that has the same name and signature as something in the parent, since it's non-virtual, we're not actually overriding it. We'll still have both copies. So the implementations of the methods are pretty straightforward. You may notice that there's this const keyword here. And again, that just indicates that this method is not intended to change the state of the object. Again, it's another thing that doesn't affect how the program runs, but it just ensures that the compiler is doing a check to make sure that I don't do anything that might create the state of the, the object to change inside this method. So if, for example, I said length equals five, it's going to give me an error and it's going to say the expression has to be a modifiable L value. Well, that's the error because I can't change anything because this is a const function. And if I took that declaration off, then that error goes away. So again, I think most of these functions are pretty straightforward as far as what they do. Print prints the length and width of the shape and print type checks to see that if actually the length is equal to the width, it'll say that it's a square, even though it's a rectangle. And we'll still have a square class in the future. So maybe we could get rid of this, for, but I'll leave it in there for now. So that's our rectangle. Now let's take a look at our triangle class. Again, almost identical to the rectangle, except now we have a base and a height instead of a length and a width, but everything else is pretty much the same. Also, you'll notice we're not doing a print type method here. As a reminder, print type is a virtual method. So if I don't implement that in the base class, there's still an implementation in the shape class. One other thing I want to make sure that I mention is you'll notice that I, I don't have a CPP file for shape. And the reason for that is, is that this is simple enough that I'm going to go ahead and just include everything here. None of these are really detailed functions. In fact, all of these, these, these objects are really probably simple enough that I would just, in practice, something this simple, I would just implement it all in one header file. But again, the idea here is to show you how the header files work with the CPP files so that we can, and then how we build. So, 
that's why we have that separation. It's not really because you have to do it. It's good practice in general, and certainly with more complicated classes, with more complicated functions, you would definitely want to have that separation. So we've seen the triangle header file and the C++ file, again, pretty much the same as triangle, except that the calculation changes for the area and the height. So now with circle, we're going to define pi, and we're going to have a private float member for the radius. So a couple things about circle that I want to point out. Since circle only has one member, this constructor has just one parameter. Now you may say, well, there's two. Well, actually there's only one required one, which is R. So you can create an object with just one parameter. Well, unfortunately, when that happens, there are cases where C++ will say, oh, you're using a float in place of a circle. So I'll just create a circle object there. Most of the time we want to avoid that. So I'm making this what's called an explicit constructor by using the explicit keyword. And what that says is don't implicitly generate a circle from a float. The only time you should create an object is if I'm explicitly instantiating an object of type circle. And here you see the area in the perimeter again and print. So we're not going to implement the print type here, just area perimeter and print. Those implementations again are not quite correct, but we can fix that pretty easily. So the area of a circle is pi times the radius times the radius, and the perimeter is 2 times pi times the radius. And that's my circle class. And then the last class we're going to implement is our square. Again, it is derived from rectangle, so we're going to include rectangle. We don't actually need the pi here, but I guess now you can guess which class I copied and pasted to get this. And notice I'm not implementing any methods here except for print because square is a rectangle and our square is just a rectangle where the side is the same. So I have this one data member, but I'm passing that same thing to the rectangle constructor. So really, I don't even need the side variable here. So I'm going to take that out. And then I'll implement print in my C++ file. And you can see there where I was using the side. In that case, I'll just use the length so that that will still work. And now I need to go back to rectangle the header file and make sure that that's protected. So again, hopefully you see how sometimes we have to make some updates in our class hierarchy to have it do the thing we want. Now, one thing I want to do before we call it done, I want to make sure I'm not including something I don't need to. So for example, in square, I don't need shape that HPP here. So I'm going to take that out and I'm going to go through each of them very quickly just to make sure they're correct. So for triangle HVP, I do need to include shape because that's how it knows about the class it's deriving. Triangle CPP is fine. Square is including just rectangle. And you'll notice for each of these in the C file, I'm including the appropriate header file. Rectangle includes shape. We don't need to include shape there, I don't believe. We'll test that out once we print, once we compile, but I think we're good. And again, we don't need to include shape here because we don't actually use it. The circle.hpp includes shape.hpp. So we're still including it indirectly through circle.hpp. So we don't have to explicitly include shape.hpp. So finally, our main function is going to include all of the header files we just created. I can instantiate a shape, but I'll instantiate a rectangle, a triangle, a circle, and a square. And I'll also create an array of shape pointers that has a bunch of shapes in it. And then for each of those shapes, I'll print the shape, call print type, and print out a line with its area and perimeter. And then finally, when I get to the end for the shape pointer array, I'll go through the array with a for each loop and print out the same things. And that looks like I'm missing a tab there. So let's see how that works. Let's go ahead and compile. And I'm using a make file here because I have to compile all the C++ files together. So I'll do a make clean and I'll do a make. And here's my output. So here, my variables, you can see they print what you would expect. And then you can go through and check that these also print what you would expect, again, based on whether the methods were virtual or not and so forth. So for example, this print type is non-virtual. So since we're using a shape pointer, it prints I am a shape for all of the shapes. It doesn't print I am a rectangle or I am a square.
Okay, so that is an introduction to how to use header files in C++. Again, the idea is your interface items, like your class definition, goes in the header file. The implementation goes in the C++ file. And then you include your header file and compile with the C++ file.